Thank you for having me. So uh, my name is Eugene, this is me, um, but I'm also known as Dr. Burrito. And so I'm gonna share with you today a little bit about how that happened to me. So as a university student, I became interested in studying the atmosphere, and in particular, these three environmental issues, air pollution, acid rain, and ozone depletion. As a, as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, I got to experience air pollution myself, playing soccer in downtown LA, and so I knew what it felt like to have my lungs irritated by these aerosols. I also got to witness the, um, the effects of acid rain, and also studied about ozone depletion. And so those issues were really real to me and they helped encourage me to, to use science to study these issues. But I had some good news, at least from my perspective. And that is that we have developed solutions to these issues and I was able to witness and, and observe those. For example, air pollution. Today, the air quality is much better in Los Angeles than when I grew up in the 70s, even though there's three times as many cars. Acid rain is something that we have um, developed some solutions to, cleaner burning coal, and although it's still an issue in some parts of the world, um, largely it's improved a lot. And the issue that I worked on as a scientist was ozone depletion, and we have phased out ozone depleting chemicals. We're starting to see those chemicals um, level off and decline, and we're actually starting to see a recovery of the ozone layer. We expect ozone levels to recover in the next 20 to 30 years, and maybe we'll even get a super recovery. That means extra ozone. So that was kind of my look at atmospheric science and, and these environmental issues. Now today, um, there's another issue, and that is climate change. And um, over the last 20 years, I've been studying our Earth's climate and its change. And this is a, um, a temperature chart that shows how temperatures have been changing over the last 110 years. And this is what I've been studying myself, is those little blips. And you can see that it goes up and down, but it's been doing more up than down. And especially over the last 40 years, we've been witnessing um, the Earth's global temperature rise. And it's not just the temperature that's going up, this is not the only signal. We've seen like these giant ice sheets like over Norway in the 1918 and what it looks like today. Um, so lots of loss of ice. And here's another example in Northern Alaska uh, and then today. And so that's a very common kind of feature that we've been observing. Although one thing that I found interesting that scientists really haven't studied is that this little iceberg right here persisted over 85 years of warming um, and, is, and is still there. So someone's got to kind of check that out. No, actually, that's a joke. Um, but, uh, but what isn't a joke is that we are losing um, ice on the planet, and this shows what the Arctic sea ice used to look like compared to today. And as a result of that, in California, especially here, we're seeing the impacts of climate change today. We're seeing the increases in fire, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing severe storms. And all of this is causing our planet to change. Now, I was thinking about this and kind of thinking back to what I, see, what I saw with air pollution, what I saw with acid rain and with ozone depletion. And here's how I, when I looked at climate change, here's how I thought this story would go. So I'm gonna just tell you this little story. And it starts with once upon a time. There was a scientist named Eugene, that's me. And every day he studied the climate system. But one day he noticed that the planet was warming, and because of that, he tried to figure out why. And he looked at this, and he investigated that, until finally he figured out that human activities were the primary cause. And after sharing the evidence with fancy plots, with nice colors, people and the policymakers changed their ways to reduce the causes of the warming planet. And this would be our future, a clean and healthy planet for everyone. Now, obviously, it didn't turn out quite that way that I had envisioned this. I would call this a cli-fi story or climate fiction because despite all this amazing technology that we have today to reduce carbon emissions, we see that the Earth's temperature is continuing to rise. And despite policymakers working together like the Paris Accord to, and 150 countries signing on to say, we're gonna do something about climate change, CO2 emissions continue to go up and in fact, 2018 was the highest CO2 emissions on record. So actually, we're not making the kind of progress that we thought we would. And then if we look at projections of how temperature is going to change within our lifetime, and that's what all these, these lines are, we see that all of them continue to show our planet's temperature rising even faster. 
and that the only thing that the international community can agree on is that red line that says two degrees C, and we've all agreed that we don't want to let the temperature go above two, and yet all those projections have it going well above that. And yet there is one suggestion, one climate trajectory, the far one, that has us stabilizing our climate at a, quote, safe level. And so for myself, I studied these climate models, I studied these little wiggles and these projections, and what this led me to, to think about was how to solve this climate crisis. Because it's not getting, I'm not, we're not witnessing any real change, at least significant. It reminded me of a, so in thinking about this, it reminded me of a movie that I saw, which was called the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama uh, Renaissance. It's an interesting story. It's a, a group of folks, primarily in the United States, supposedly the greatest thought leaders around. And they said, they were looking at problems of the world, climate change and, and uh, uh, looking at issues related to poverty and, um, and hunger and crime. And they said, if we took the greatest minds and we put them all together, and we put ourselves under the presence of the Dalai Lama, who's also one of the greatest thought leaders we have today, maybe we could solve some of these big problems. So they gathered what they thought were the greatest minds around. They took a trip to, to India, and they put themselves in the presence of the Dalai Lama, and they had a conference there. And the goal was to solve the, some of the world's greatest problems. So they got there, they got all set up. Um, but then it didn't really unfold in the way that they thought it would. And it turns out they started bickering among themselves about who's going to actually meet with the Dalai Lama and who's not going to, and then what subcommittee you're going to be on. And, you know, these are very highly accomplished individuals. And so it just, anyhow, so when they finally got a chance to talk to the Dalai Lama, um, he said to them, I think before you solve anyone else's problems, you need to look within yourself and solve your own problems first. So then I started to think, if I wanted to solve and be in part of solving the climate crisis, um, and I went into the presence of the Dalai Lama, and I asked him, how do you, so like, what can we do? Um, I wondered how he would respond to me. Maybe he would say the same thing, look within yourself. So I did. And uh, this is what I found. A burrito. Yes, it's true, I, I eat a lot of burritos. I, I like burritos. They're one of my favorite foods. Okay, they're my favorite food. Um, but, uh, and I'm not the only one who likes them. Uh, if you look at this uh, website called 538, Nate Silver, he does the tracking of uh, political elections. Um, he also tracks sports. Um, the top statisticians in the country are working uh, to understand different variations. They also turn their attention to the search for the best burrito. Um, and one thing they did is they quantified this, so they calculated an index called the value over the regular burrito. And, uh, and identified that California was indeed the best state for getting burritos. So that, yes, yeah, give it up for California. So that convinced me that indeed my true home state was the correct one. Um, also, they looked at what was the best burrito in the country. And uh, number one is in the 24th in Mission in San Francisco, El Faroito. It turns out to be my favorite burrito place in San Francisco. Um, so, I confirmed that I know a little bit about, intuitively about burritos. But then I transferred this to kind of my own world, which is about climate. And I did something called a burrito showdown, where I compare the carbon footprint of a beef burrito compared to a chicken burrito. And I found out that the simple choice we make at a local taqueria actually has a big impact, and that the beef burrito has five times as large a carbon footprint. Now, this is what got me kind of interested in food. And it turned out that I ended up writing a book about food and climate change with a, a chef and an environmental food activist named Laura Steck. And it actually taught me something really, um, for me, very valuable. And that was that those charts that we'd been producing as climate scientists of all those things going up um, were impactful for other climate scientists, but were not as impactful for other general folks. But the talking about food, which is something deeply personal, is potentially more impactful. So when we went and talked to people about food and climate and about their own personal choices and their own under interest in understanding about what to eat, which is actually a really challenging problem and question that we all have at some point, um, we, it took on more meaning. So I took some of these ideas to some colleagues at San Jose State outside the science community. So I took this to storytellers and artists and educators. And we started to think about how to communicate with younger audiences, with folks 
that are going to be the future designers and innovators uh, of our world. And so we invented Green Ninja. And so Green Ninja is a climate action superhero who takes action on climate change and is manifested through films, through games, and through educational experiences. Now, the goal in Green Ninja is to make learning science about the environment fun and also rewarding, and we use humor, and we, use, we talk a lot about solutions. We also talk about, guess what? Burritos. No, it's not the key feature, but there are a couple of videos about burritos. Here I am interrogating the carbon footprint of two different types of burritos with my fancy burrito meter. <laughs> and here's an image that you may have never seen before in your life. I hope you're ready. This is a burrito farm. Um, this is where burritos grow. And uh, I've just pulled one out of the ground. I don't know if you can see the roots on that. It's a really big, <laughs> deep-rooted burrito. Um, when you go to your favorite taqueria, uh, they snip that off. You don't know they're doing that, but that's what they do. If you get a job at a taqueria, they'll teach you how to do that. Um, of course, that's just kind of silliness. But the use of humor is deliberate because if you spend some time thinking about the environment, um, it can be a little depressing. And so we need a little humor um, in that. And what we found in our research was that uh, when, and we've been doing academic research about student motivation and, st and student engagement, that there's three key factors that you need to include or that we found that we needed to include to create a meaningful educational experience that can promote long-term behavior change. I'm going to share those with you. Number one is a personal connection. So students need to develop some kind of personal connection to this issue not just an academic one, but a, a connection that, oh, I know I've, I've experienced something to do with climate change or severe weather, or my family has, or some relevant connection. Students need to know what to do about it, what the solutions are, and not just that, but they need to develop experience doing that. And finally, students need to have some empathy for the environment. And that could come from childhood trips into nature, that could come from a film, that could come from their love of animals, or plants. And without any, each of those pieces, you may not be able to promote a long-term behavior change, which, which is really our goal. So um, as an example, there's many folks who are working in the climate field trying to produce solutions to our environmental problems. And they're suggesting things like rooftop solar and offshore wind, electric vehicles, LED lights, and those are all fantastic solutions. But what we did is we tried to measure the impact that education could have. And we measured the carbon footprint of students who had taken our courses five years after they graduated from college. And we found that their carbon emissions were about three tons lower than the average Californian. And if we were to scale, and they attribute that to their educational experience. And if we were to scale that in the same way that we scale these other solutions, we are suggesting in our paper that climate change education could be just as impactful as other climate change mitigation strategies. What are we talking about? We're really talking about human capital. So it's great to have all this technology, but if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have the leadership, if you don't have the inspiration of the people around this technology, then you're not going to implement it fast enough to really create the types of solutions that we're thinking to move towards. Now, many uh, schools, Many cities, many states, many countries develop climate action plans. You'll see them around. They talk about things like transportation and energy and buildings and food and water. And those are really good plans. But almost always, the one thing missing in those plans is education. And what we're trying to do is document and describe why education is an essential component to any climate action plan. So we started a company three years ago called Green Ninja, and we build science curriculum that inspires students to de design a more sustainable world. Um, we use something called a purpose-based curriculum where students are going to solve real-world problems using great appropriate science and engineering. It's kind of like there's a little roadmap here where they're given a unit challenge, they're going to try to conserve water, they're going to try to design a more efficient transportation system, then they learn the science and engineering they need to, and then at the end they actually do it. And as a result of that, we're hoping to create meaning and purpose in students' lives and experience in solving local and relevant environmental issues. We also incorporate data into our curriculum so that students can measure and assess how, how successful they are. And so we have uh, phone apps, so we have um, students using their smart meters, we have students using 
um, different technologies along the way to measure the impact. And also we want to be able to prove that this educational experience is helpful. Of course, our real goal is to inspire young people and to leverage their curiosity, their, um, their desire to learn things, and their wonder about nature to help create a cleaner and healthier planet for everyone. And I don't think there couldn't be a better example of someone doing that than this young woman. So this is Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old from Sweden. And when she was 15, in ninth grade, she decided she had enough about hearing about climate change. She wanted to see action. So every Friday, she, she staged her own protest, her own strike, and she went, instead of going to school, she went to the steps of parliament, and any adult who walked by, she would talk to them and say, why are you jeopardizing my future by your inaction on climate change? She was doing this solitary just by herself. But after a few months, the media started to pick up on it, and so did other young people. And they started to join her in other parts of the world. She's very articulate. She's very well-spoken. She has a strong emotional connection to nature. And in December of last year, she was invited to the UN Climate Summit, and she spoke there. She met with the Pope two weeks ago. And she also addressed the European Union's parliament. And she spoke very emotionally to them. And she said, why have there been three emergency meetings on Brexit and no emergency meetings on climate? She begged the lawmakers there to do something about climate change for her generation and future generations. And that's why I believe that education is the key to solving the climate crisis. Thank you. <laughs>